and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome, everybody, to a Reverend Faith and Current Affairs with Revs Jamie Franklin, that's me, and Thomas Bellum. Tom, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks, Jamie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, very well. Very it's good, good. Very good. Um, good. Uh, bowled the best ball I've ever bowled last week. Oh, really? So, yeah, what, yeah. How, so what was it like? Yeah, I, got a, I got a sort of reverse swing somehow. I don't really know how. It kind of, uh, it sort of, swing. It sort of est its way through the air. Did it get the person out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah it, would to, it? It. it would have to, otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the best ball, no. no but yeah. actually, often it's the worst balls that get people out. Because mm. they, 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 they see a bad ball and try and do something silly with it. Okay, and okay. And they, well, they get themselves out. But this was just, you know, just defeated the batsman yeah. and just smashed the bales off and it was all in all. You know, you're, an, all... you're an amazing man, Tom. You really are. Yeah, you. You're Thank quite, you. you're quite, just the, the, the list of achievements just is, is, <laughs> is literally unending. So. <laughs> Well done. We're, we're holding the fort, aren't we? I don't know where Daniel's gone. He seems to have gone on holiday forever. <laughs> the whole of August. Um, yeah, yeah <laughs> he's anyway. gone on holiday for a really long time. I don't begrudge him uh, a really long holiday. His first, his holiday. He told us it was his first holiday in years, wasn't it? So, Yeah, it can't be his first holiday of any sort for years. I don't think that's right, is it? Because he, he wouldn't have just been working nonstop. Maybe he means it's his first foreign holiday. Maybe. He maybe travel. he has just been working full stop, you know. Yeah. He might have maybe, maybe he's actually only 27, but he's just been working so hard that he looks... He's got the appearance of a <laughs> older man. Yeah. yeah. He's drained himself, yeah. Anyway, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, listen, Tom, we've got lots to talk about today. The main thing we're going to be talking about is this big opinion survey that's been that's come out in the Times. They've, they've done a survey of some vicars, uh, and apparently it shows shocking results uh, as to what vicars actually believe um people might find that interesting i hope they do uh, we're going to talk we're going to devote some time to it because we think it's it's important and uh, touches on a number of themes which are relevant to this uh, podcast and we've got a few other things we might get to um as as time goes on but we're gonna we're gonna talk about that uh, probably first thing after our scripture um um reading just a a quick notice, um, the Irreverend Meetup at March for Life, uh, which I'll be at, none of the other vicars will. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I don't want people to turn up and think, oh, I'm going to meet Tom, the the legend Tom Pelham, or I'm going to meet the legend Daniel French, and then just be upset because it's only me. It's only me. I'm the only one who's going to be there, Jamie Franklin. But hopefully other people are going to come too. It's the March for Life, which is basically, as it sounds, it's a pro-life march um there's a big sort of some kind of conference thing that happens beforehand i don't really know i've never been before but i've heard it's really really good uh we are meeting at 10 30 at the Emanuel center um which is in westminster in london at the voice for justice stands um so it's just completely um free form it's not formal it's just an opportunity for irreverent people to to meet up and to say hello to each other and to participate in the march to the extent they want to i think what i'll probably do is i'll probably download um telegram on my phone so that i can do updates about you know what's going on during the day so i do get on our telegram uh, group which is a reverend uh, what is it uh, it's a reverend how is it t dot yeah sorry it's t dot me forward slash irreverend or just go on Telegram and search for a reverend and, and join us uh, there because that's the way you keep up with what's going on. Um, so, yeah, March for Life, meet at the Emmanuel Centre at the Voice for Justice stand, which I think is on the bottom floor at 10.30. And then we will be there um, you know, for a certain amount of time. Sorry if that sounds vague, but it's a good thing to support. And um, I'm looking forward to being there, to meeting some of you. I know there are at least some people who are showing up, so hopefully it will be many, many people, and we can have some lovely chats and uh, participate in what's going on. Um, that's the only notice I've got, Tom. No so, notices here, so it's... Uh, no, apart, no. From your, apart from your greatness. And, uh, as uh, Oscar Wilde said at Customs, I have nothing to c- declare except for my genius. Um, is that true, though? Or is it apocryphal, Tom? I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Who knows what, 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 what was really said? Uh, Anyway, let's do some scripture now. Um, We're going to do uh, Matthew 16, verses 30 to 20. um, And this is, uh, well, we thought of this because we thought it might be relevant to the first story we're going to talk about, which I think it is. Uh, It was actually the the scriptural passage from um, the Holy Communion 
or the Holy Mass in the, uh, what's it called, Tom, your favourite lectionary in the world, the revised common lectionary uh, from Sunday. We know how much you love it. Um, but anyway, I think it is I think it is relevant to, um, that's an in-joke, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, Tom hates the revised common le- lectionary. He goes to he goes to bed at night cursing it. Um, yeah, he's not rising to it. He's not saying anything. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I read it? Shall I read it? Yeah, yeah, we should do the Lord's Prayer first. Oh, okay, you go. Go on, you, you do it, you do it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Go on then, Tom. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Mm. Very good. Um, yeah, so I, I did a sermon on this the weekend, and um, as I was reading the um, opinion survey thing, um, one of the things I said came back to me, <clears throat> and it relates to verse 18, when it said, you know, I've got an um, English standard version here. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, and you now uh, there are various ways of approaching that verse. I mean, the sort of famous Roman Catholic interpretation is that this is you know christ f- founding the papacy upon upon peter who passed it on to subsequent um generations um but there is another interpretation which i think is legitimate and it's it's that when christ says on this rock i will build my church he doesn't well what he what he may be referring to is not so much peter as an individual but the confession of faith that peter makes um you are the christ the son of the living god and I think there's, you know, there's room for there's room for sort of debate as to what Christ means here. But I think there is there is definitely something of that in this passage. You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Um, on this, it's, it's a pun, it's a pun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a pun on Peter's name. Yeah, it's a pun on Peter's yeah. name. I mean, one thing. So, like, that's that's quite important. So, Peter Cephas means rock, and I think, um, I think it's Petra, isn't it? Petra. Sorry. Um, yeah, Petra. Um, Cephas means rock as well, doesn't it? Um, the because he's referred to as that. Mm, I don't my Greek New Testament. With anyway, you're right. I mean, you're right. Petra. Uh, anyway, Peter. The words, the words "rock" and "Peter" sound the same in in yeah. Greek, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, and so, um, so so that there's a pun on his name going on. So let's not forget that Jesus was was not you know he was human. He he punned. He 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 had fun. He had fun with language. So you see, there's that that's happening. Um, and 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 yes, um, so it's not only. But the, why is he a rock? Um, he's a rock because he's 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 um, uh, in the end uh, he's proclaimed what the truth about Christ. So the rock is the truth of, of Christ's nature, isn't it as well? Um, yeah, yeah. And as I say, I think there's I think there's a bit. I wouldn't want to sort of completely rule out the the sort of that Christ is founding his church upon Peter and the apostles personally. But that's yeah. not that's well, not. No, I don't, I don't I don't want to rule that out either. I mean, because yeah, that, yeah. that, that's in, completely in accordance with the, with the Protestant understanding of the church as well. Yeah, it's not it's um, not really what I wanted to focus on though. No, no. The, I what I wanted to focus on is the fact that it's the confession of faith upon which Christ says he'll build his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the 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 point I wanted to draw out there is that Christ built his church upon faith and faithfulness in him. And that's the that's the promise that we have. Those are the promises of God to us. And if we are faithful to him, if we trust in him, if we confess him faithfully, 
then he will build the church. You know, that's the promise of God. We don't know exactly how that how much how that will happen. You know, we don't know exactly what it will look like from from place to place. But that is what Christ says. And also, just empirically, that is what happens, isn't it? When when you have churches which faithfully proclaim the message of the gospel and they don't compromise on doctrine and ethics, these churches, if it's done, if it's done well, these churches invariably grow. And as you look at sort of demographic trends, you can see that reflected in trends. And when churches don't do that, when they apostatize and when they start preaching false go- uh, false doctrine and preaching a false gospel, they shrink and they die away. And you could just see this happening. You don't even have to you know, look at it from the perspective of faith. You can just see it just in, in statistics that do- denominations you know, like, for example, the Episcopal Church in the U.S., which compromise and wash down the faith and preach false doctrines, they shrink and die because, well, people aren't interested in it, but on a kind of spiritual level, God does not bless faithlessness in the church. But if we are faithful, if we confess Christ faithfully, and if we do our very best to make that profession consistent, then we have the promises of God that we can rely on. Yeah. So that's that's what I wanted to say. Uh, go on, you go. I, I also think it's important to note this this little well, a bit beforehand, before that, um, when he says, um, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I think that's interesting as well. So it's not Peter's um, reasoning, not his ideas, not not what he's perceived himself that have that have given him truth, but God, God has given him truth. Mm-hmm, yeah. And God, God has sent truth into the world, literally, uh, in Christ, and and then um, and in His Scriptures. Um, so, so it's not you know the the reason reasoning is is useful and helpful and can be really godly, but it's not um, uh, you know the, the fundamentally the the church is founded on the revelation of God in the Bible, isn't it? Not mm-hmm. um, and and the Bible is the we we hold is the is the accurate um, and and spirit. Uh, sort of motivated um records of that time and the apostolic teaching that jesus passed on so you know it's um it's, i mean it all comes around to the same thing uh but it's not sort of something that's been reasoned out of out of you know it's not something where people have gone oh i think this is probably true it's something that's been given yeah 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 absolutely so i think that's a good that's a good scripture to start on just to sort of orientate ourselves tom because um this um vicar opinion survey that was released in the times today um, it can be it can be sort of somewhat um, distressing reading this. Um, so just to give a bit of context, so uh, and as always, we'll share this link on the on the notes and everything. But um, the Times has basically done a a survey of clergy in the Church of England, and I'll just read I'll just read the uh, thing here. So Times survey shows priests desire for dramatic shifts in doctrine on issues such as sex, sexuality, marriage, and the role of women. Um, and we'll get into specifics, uh, but I think it was a survey of something like just over 1,400, about 1,500 clergy or something like that. And um, obviously the Times is presenting it as um, this sort of um, showing these sort of historic and um, significant shifts in clergy attitudes. And the article is skewed in a, in a particular direction. It's notable um, they've got about one traditional or sort of uh, evangelical Orthodox response. There's no, no no one from the Anglo-Catholic wing. They couldn't be bothered to find anyone to talk about that because uh, yeah. um, at all. I'm, but, um, I'm, always, I'm always available, Tom. Yeah, I know. Always, always, always um, available. Always uh, available for the Times if they want. If they want a, but we, we, should, we should start with, with the one underlying thing, shouldn't we? You know, this this before we talk about any of this. Um, so um, is that the church? It doesn't do theology based on, on you know, on on opinion surveys. That's that's. I mean, it, it, so in one sense, like the, the answer to this is well. So what? It, yeah. it, it's not. It's not how the church has ever decided. It's um, how, how its theology is done. Its theology is is founded on on the witness of God in the Bible that has to be read. In accordance with itself, um, in the Church of England, this this witness is is um, is particularly found in in the historic formularies and the thirty nine articles, that which tell us how the Church of England, uh, even today, is supposed to look at the Bible. So it's not really it doesn't really matter what all the clergy think. 
So that's the first thing to say, because that's not because, you know, because we're seeking truth and truth isn't done by percentages. Yeah. It's, it's done by truth. You know, if you've got, you know, 40 people to say that green was red and another and only 20 people said that red was green, you know, that it wasn't it wouldn't actually change. Yeah, the truth, it, it, would it? it's, it's um, not it's not an irrelevant story, but the conclusion that appears to be being drawn is not the yeah. same conclusion we would draw. No, no, it's not. So, so that's the first thing. Like, it's not. It's not irrelevant. It's interesting. We're going to talk about it at length because it's interesting. But, but the first thing is that the people who, you know, there are a few voices throughout this. Are you know somehow they managed to find plenty of voices to make this argument. Oh, you know, now the church is ready to move on. You know, uh, that that's nonsense. This doesn't matter. The second thing that's worth pointing out um, about surveys is the methodology. So. Um, they, 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 we don't have the full methodology here, but here we go. The time selected five thousand. Did, you, did you take it, by the way, Tom? No, I took it. I took really? the survey. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You carry um, on. The time selected five thousand. I wasn't selected. Uh, five thousand pieces at random from among those with English addresses and Clockwood's clerical directory of Anglican clergy. I think I'm, I'm ex uh, off the pages of that. I, I don't really. I'm, I'm on it, but I'm not sort of contactable through it. It might be one reason why, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. And received of those five thousand, one thousand four hundred thirty-six responses. Mm -hmm. um, analyzing data from of those, the one thousand one hundred eighty-five respondents still serving. So we started with five thousand randomly, and we've got down to approximately uh, twenty percent of that, just slightly over. Um, and did you say one thousand five hundred? No, that was the responses. Then, then they've only from those they've they've analysed the only those who are still actively serving in the Church of England. So that's one thousand one hundred eighty-five. Oh, is it? It's even lower than I thought. Okay, go on. So, so it's just over twenty percent. So, so the, the really, hardly any, is it? The really important thing is to say that that there may be biases, and I don't know. It might it may have corrected for this, but I, but um, there there I don't know whether it has, and quite often they they can't really because how do you know what the biases are? Um, because uh, it is those who've responded uh, and there's an immediate bias. So are people who are really passionate about this and uh, more likely to respond than those who are not? Probably, you know, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, are those who are really busy running massive mega churches, less likely to respond than those who have all the time in their world to look after a draining congregation of liberal uh, you know, Oxford Dons, you know, there's questions there about that. Um, yeah, no, Tom, Tom, can I just add to that just before yeah. you go? I think, I think absolutely. Like people, people who are of the progressive mindset use this kind of thing in order to advance their agenda. This is just, this is just a classic kind of progressive approach, isn't it? If you get, if yeah. you get given a survey like this and you're, you're minded in that way, of course you're more likely to answer it because you think that the church should change and that the church will change based on, the opinion of the clergy, the opinion of gen general synod, the opinion of the public, and so, so on. But if you're a conservative, or I'm not even going to use the word conservative, if you're an orthodox Christian, you believe that doctrine doesn't change, and so it's basically an irrelevance whether you know what. Well, these questions are an irrelevance. I mean, the, the the answer to them is just obvious. Basically, I mean, there may be a few nuances, but essentially, it won't hold as much interest to you if you're just an orthodox cleric and you're just getting on with your job. So I think it's absolutely self-selecting the survey, and so, it's so, tiny, yeah. a thousand clergy as well. well I mean, a, th a thousand clergy could be, you know, could be representative, but not not with this way of doing it. Okay, because there's because it requires a self-selected response. The only way you get any sort of actual, I mean, okay, they selected five thousand priests at random. That doesn't really tell you much. The five thousand priests might be a subset, but what what do the you know to, uh, four thousand uh, sorry three thousand uh, eight hundred and fifteen priests who are not coming to this? What do they say? And um, so, you know, are they all basically equivalently saying, you know, not really that interested, in which case by far the most majority is, is you know, just you know, not that interested. Yeah, um, or it might imply that they've got no interest in anything changing. Yeah, well, exactly. Or, or it might just be that they're busy and couldn't be bothered. They've Maybe got other they've got larger congregations because they're all I, yeah, I, said, blessing I, said, I said that already, Jamie. <laughs> I, thought, um, I said it in a slightly more polemical way. OK, yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, but... You know, that, so that that's the first thing. So having so that's the two points. Firstly, you know, uh, this is an irrelevance in terms of how the church should direct its doctrine, and secondly, um, this is. I mean, as far as we can tell, um, that there's there's no. Um, they haven't told us the methodology, so we need to be careful about the results. They may have managed to correct for all of that, of course, but um, you know, I uh, I suspect not. Um, okay, let's go through some of these then. Woo. <laughs> Do, you, do you, I just want to um, yeah. just make a comment on the sort of overall 
I mean, the overall the overall point of this, and I, I think you're absolutely right to to point out this methodology, Tom, is uh, it's clearly it's clearly an attempt to put pressure on the church to move in a certain direction. Right. Now, I don't I don't know where I, do, I mean it's just the spirit of the age, isn't it? So we'll cut co- we'll come um, to the we'll come to the specific issues in a minute. But um, one example of this, I took the survey. They they emailed me. I don't know why I got the email and you didn't, Tom, but. Um, they in the in the question about women's ordination the question was um about the situation we have at the moment where you can have parishes that dissent from um having women priests involved essentially it's a bit more complicated than that but that's essentially what it is um and in the question itself said um you can so is it said are you happy with the situation as it is it should stay as it is um and then the other option was um would you like the um the option to not have women in clergy involved to be removed or there was just a don't know but those were the only three options yeah. but there wasn't an option to stop ordaining women yeah. and that's an absolutely that's a that's an example of like complete bias in their methodology yeah. because because they're they're not even giving you the option to say that you you think that women should be ordained, but you are, which would be innovative now. I mean, it depends how it depends on what you mean by the word innovative, but it would be a change now. But so you can't change in a more conservative direction, but you can change in a more progressive direction. So it, that's just not open to you to to say that you think it's a mistake and women shouldn't be ordained. Yeah. So it's just an example of the bias that's yeah. That's clearly behind this survey. So, so until we see the survey itself, see what questions they are, see how they dealt with the potentials of bias, then then this is meaningless. And if they haven't done the bias uh, right, and if they haven't got the questions unbiased, um, then um, um, th- then frankly, who knows? Um, yeah. And and in the in the blurb before they get into any questions, right? So at the at the beginning, it's immediately it's immediately showing what the agenda is here because it, it in the sort of headline section, it talks about priests feeling under pressure. And then there's this little paragraph at the end where it says, asked why they felt under pressure. One priest cited the pressure justifying the Church of England's position to increasingly secular and sceptical audiences. And by that, the implication is clearly not the Church of England's position, um, you know, and that that position is the right position and it yeah. should be upheld and proclaimed. But it's like the Church of England's position is wrong and I have to justify it. And it's increasingly difficult um, because secular and sceptical audience don't accept it. Which is, which Therefore, we should change it. Which is, which is I mean, I've, I've never met a priest who's actually doing that, it must be said. So I'm a little bit sceptical of that answer. Like who's, who's who doesn't agree with the Church of England, but is you know spending his whole time you know justifying it to his parishioners. Who is this? Like the, the liberal priests I know do not justify the Church of England's position to their parishioners. They say the Church of England is wrong to their parishioners. They do that. Yeah. You know, the uh, only you time know. the only time I've ever had to do that is when I was on Times Radio. I don't recall ever doing it in my ordained ministry. I don't recall ever speaking to a parishioner and them saying to me. Oh, you know, the Church of England's position on marriage is wrong. Can you please just justify that? It's just never happened. Yeah. So I just I agree with you. I think in I think this is this is sort of overblown. Anyway, Tom, do okay. you want to talk about the the particular issue? So we've got some heads or... headlines. Should we go through the headlines? So, so should we start? I mean, it's sort of let's start. I with mean, the... maybe not everyone, because the, the the stuff later on I think is a bit boring, to be honest with you. Okay. Should we well, start the, head... with the future of the church? Go on them. Go on them. Well, okay. So the future of the church. So how likely do you think it is that your church will be holding a service every Sunday in ten years' time? And then, I mean, I don't know whether this is very interesting or not, but only forty-three point nine percent said very, fairly like, uh, very likely. Twenty percent, twenty point nine, fairly likely. And then, you know, I don't, I don't really know what to make of this. Like well, some have already ceased. Ten percent say it's fairly unlikely. So. Most um, people seem to think that, I mean, what does not applicable mean? So there's 12.1% of the respondents already who are not, in fact, holding Sunday services in their church or or are not parish ministers. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's maybe that's sort of chaplains, but um, who knows? Um, uh, so that's a higher percentage of chaplains, if that's the case, than there are in the Church of England. I do not think there are 12% of, of the clergy of the Church of England are chaplains. Um, if they are, we really need to be thinking about that because <laughs> we spend a lot of money training them. So, and then they go off to, I mean, I don't say they don't, I dare say they do great things. I mean, we know some, but anyway, um, 
Right, yeah. very likely. So, so there's, Most yeah. people seem to think it's very likely, or, or, or just under 50% think it's very likely they're going to have 10. Also, what does it even mean holding? I mean, I could hold a Sunday service with three people in my church. Yeah. I, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing the, church, the, nothing the diocese could do whilst I'm here, now that I'm here, to, to stop that from happening. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And then, so, I mean, I, I don't know whether, it's, if we look at the sort of fewer, and there's also a graph here which is talking about the way that the attendances have declined. I mean, the, the clear the clear sort of implication of this is that attendance is declining and people mine, are lacking in confidence. Mine is, well, it has since historic years, but I mean, it hasn't fallen in the last two years. So I don't know quite what, what to say about that, you know. And we've, um, we've, we've, we've had new people pretty consistently yeah. have come here. I just, the, this is the point. I mean, we obviously we want to get into like, um, you know, the nitty gritty, don't we? But it's re- this is reflective of decline in the liberal and mushy middle parts of the Church of England where... Well, yeah, if only, if only 10% of respondents saying that the, the, the congregations are going to rise at all. I mean, what do you think is most likely to happen? Well, I think God's going to reveal himself in glory in Burwash, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, so let's, you know, so this is, this, this kind of shows how biased the, the, the respondents are really in a sense, because um, there's a sort of lack of hope there, isn't there? Well, there's, there's uh, a lack of faith. Lack and, of faith, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I expect my, my congregation to keep, to keep rising. Um, and again, it comes back to what we've, what we've been talking about, isn't it? So if we have a faith in Christ and we proclaim the gospel faithfully, then God will bless his church and he will bring people in who he wants to to save and, and be added to the church. But there's no this is none of this is coming from a perspective of faith. So we've got Professor Linda Woodhead from King's College London, uh, a fine university, but I don't agree with what she says here. Um, she says uh, the church has found itself in recent decades pushed apart from public opinion on what's right and wrong on issues like sex and sexuality. Um, Woodhead added, this survey shows the clergy take a more moderate position from their le- than their leaders. Frontline priests are more in touch with their congregations and ordinary people. If they had been listened to more by leaders, the church might be in a better place today. Wrong. Wrong, oh, yeah. Linda Woodhead. We don't also, care. I'm not, I'm not convinced that we have got a frontline clergy taking a more moderate position than their leaders. I mean, have they done this survey on the bishops? Uh, yeah, and they're I mean, not, I mean, they're I mean, not I'm in bit... touch. I don't think they're in touch. With, with their congregations and ordinary people. I honestly don't. I think the majority well, of people in the country want the church to represent Christianity. I mean, that may be, that may be well, a... I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird little opinion to draw from a survey just talking to the leadership. I mean, this, has the equivalent survey been done properly? The same questions asked of the, of, of the congregations? I mean, it's, she's, she's just... Um, I she's, have got heard a, she's got an agenda. Got a, she's got an agenda. Anyway, okay. So here's a go next. Next up, after a bit about, you know, how we got fewer worshippers over the year, which we know about, um, should we read? Should we read the, the Bishop of Leeds statement? Well, yeah. Again, you know, his. I mean, Nick Baines. Um, I think he had a tradition of, of being. He comes from the evangelical, but he's not evangelical anymore, is he? He's, he's, he's liberalised quite significantly. Well, it starts. Um, it starts well, doesn't it? So he says the church is the church, and as such, not a club. It has a distinct vocation that does not include seeking popularity. Correct. Fair enough. True. Yep. Good. That's right. Re- but then he carries on, and then this is where you start thinking. Mm, Repentance means being open to changing our mind in order that society should encounter both love and justice. And this sometimes go. This means sometimes going against the flow of popular culture, however uncomfortable well, that, that might be. Well, that's, that's true as well. Of, yeah. I agree with all of it, but that sentence about repentance. Um, repentance means being open to changing our mind in order that society should encounter both love and justice. But to, I mean, I, it really depends. I mean, because they've, they've cut up uh, an interview here, haven't they? So, so it, it doesn't... They've obviously... It's obviously not continuous, is it? You, that would make no sense as, as a statement, would it? The church is the church and as such not a club. It has a distinct vocation that does not include seeking popularity. Repentance means being open to changing your mind. I mean, what's he been asked and, and what's what they cut out? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a quote without any context. Hmm. I, but it is, I mean, repentance means turning about, I mean, fundamentally, doesn't it? So it does mean changing your mind and changing your hearts. Uh, and, and, you know, and calling to society to repent for its, its manifold evils means... Um, it, it would in, it would encourage encounter with love and justice. There's nothing strictly speaking mm. wrong about what he said. Okay. All right, yeah, I don't that's, know. That's good interpretation. I, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's really what he's saying. <laughs> well, I, I just don't know. It's hard. We to, don't know hard. what he's saying. So I don't we've... think he's saying that that society needs to repent. I think he's saying <laughs> needs to repent. Isn't he? <laughs> well, do you know what? I look at this and I think church uh, 
the ministers need to repent. But anyway, um, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, so, I, so one one thing I want to pick up on before we moved on actually is the um, it's got the um, diocese ranked in how in terms of how bad they've done in terms of decline from 2014 to 2021. So Leicester is the worst with a minus 26 percent change in in attendance. Uh, I went through this and I found my diocese, Winchester's done quite well, actually. It's towards the end, minus yeah, 13.7. So is, so is and yours, yours is even better, minus 11.3%. But yeah. right at the, at the top, I mean, they've ranked this in the wrong order because they've done, you know, the worst ones first. But Lincoln has actually grown point two one point, um, sorry, plus 2.1%. And it looks like about two years ago, it like shot up massively. And who've Lincoln got? Are they, what, what tradition is their, is their diocese? I don't know. I mean, Bishop Edward King was the uh, Bishop of Lincoln, wasn't he? But um, that was well, some years ago now. Yeah, maybe it's, it's his, maybe it's his his prayers and his intercession from heaven that's that's blessing the diocese. Maybe Southwark Southwark have been growing mostly. I mean, again, you you see, you see again and again like um, how devastating the pandemic was, don't you? Because that you see it in every single diocese, even ones that had been turning around. So Sheffield growing and then down you know chichester staying very steady even growing a bit and then right down you know this this um really is indicative of not of theology but of the the pandemic response um yes the ostensible pandemic okay, yeah okay fine um yeah i mean winchester is terrible winchester was you know very very steady and then just then there's a sharp just, decline when yeah. covid happened yeah uh, so anyway, so big, big things then, I suppose. Historic shift on, historic, Tom, it's historic, uh, shift on gay marriage and questions of sex. The majority of priests want the church to conduct same-sex wedding for the first time, formally drop a centuries-old opposition to premarital and gay sex in a historic shift that campaigners hope will lead to a change in teachers. Uh, um, uh, see, there we go, there we go. So that, that, that's, that's that, that point which I made at first. You know, it doesn't really matter that the majority of priests want something, you know, it's, it doesn't make theology from wanting. Yeah, that's not, that's not theology. That's that's uh, as you know. It's it's um the difference between exegesis and eisegesis, isn't it? You know, it's re- <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Know. And then it says, I mean, this part's correct. The church teaches that only weddings between a man and a woman are permitted in church. In um, fact, it, 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 it's that, more than that. It's more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. It, but just as it goes, and that sex is only permissible within heterosexual marriages. That, that's I mean, true. Word, but the word heterosexual is redundant there because um, because there aren't, there's nothing but heterosexual marriages but essentially that's that's correct well no it's not it's not correct it doesn't teach that weddings between a man and woman are only permitted in church uh, only weddings between a man and woman are permitted in church it teaches that any weddings that aren't between a man and a woman are not weddings mm, they're not yeah. you know but anyway yeah no, no that's 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 correct but at least they have at least they've actually said what the church is what the church is teaching is. I mean, there are people who would dispute that. Like when I spoke to Jane Ozan, I mean, she just you know, like flat out contradicted that that was the teaching of the church. Um, she really? Okay. She hasn't read her canons, has she? She, she just said, um, oh, no, that's not what people think anymore. No, no, no. Well, but this is exactly the thing. disingenuous it? for saying it. I know, it's I just, know. It's just a statement your, fact. Your proudest moment, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, one of them, yeah. Uh, bishops right, okay. have, however, said that they will allow priests to bless gay couples and under pressure to go further and permit oh sorry and are under pressure to go further and permit same-sex weddings they are considering whether to drop the teaching that gay sex is quote incompatible with christian teaching and whether to allow gay priests to have civil weddings and well we'll just, i mean they, they can't change that they're not going to change they, they're not considering or at least they shouldn't be considering that because that would require change in doctrine wouldn't it this is the this is where it gets another bit of disingenuous here they're not they're not considering that Mm-hmm. And then they're not they're not saying they're going to allow priests to bless gay couples either. It's not strictly speaking what's happening. Um they're they they're, they're very <laughs> even in the in the prayers as they stand, they're being very disingenuous about what what it what they're actually doing, which is not blessing the gay couples, but blessing the individuals within a gay relationship or something like I don't quite know how they're squaring that circle, but they're they're, they're sort of wiggling around it, aren't they? Um, yeah, yeah, and you can see the way all of this is presented is like they are under pressure for this yeah. to happen at that time. It's all this kind of you know this liberal progressive narrative that you know history is moving in one direction and it's inevitable and the pressure you have to give in to the pressure eventually because that's the way the tide is going. Uh, so anyway, so fifty nine percent of priests say they will offer blessings to same sex couples if that uh, general synod proposal is backed. Thirty two point three percent say they won't. Eight point seven percent say they don't know. It's a bit weird. Um, so head in the sand, priests there. Don't know. Yeah, I haven't thought about it. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really think... thought of it. Not really important. Okay, okay. 
Do you think um, the Church of England should or should not allow priests to conduct same-sex weddings? Uh, uh, 53.4% say yes. Uh, should not, 36.5%. Not sure, 10.1%. Um, would you do same-sex weddings? 492 say yes. 41 say no. So, and then 9.8 say don't know. So that actually could be more even it, with those don't knows they could you know they could make up that and that would be more like 50 50 wouldn't it yeah and then there's do you think that the church of England should or should not allow gay priests to enter enter into civil marriages with their partners 63.3 percent say yes uh 28 no this is, what, no. this is it's a bit really odd so there are there are certain people who will not offer blessings to same-sex couples say that should not offer same-sex weddings, won't conduct same-sex weddings, but would allow priests to just have, you know, sexual relationships with whoever they want. I mean, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it? I mean, why just gay priests? Why not, why not have straight priests have, you know, premarital sex with whoever they like? I mean, why not? Where, well, what's the um, argument here? Where, where are they going to draw a line? You know? I mean, you'd, you'd, have, you'd, have to, um, you'd have to sort of speak to these people individually and get them to sort of justify their position. But it does yeah. seem odd, doesn't it, to, to be in favour of blessings but not be willing to do same-sex weddings or be in favor of them and then to it's a bit strange i mean again i mean it's anyway i mean yeah, it's not really uh, the point is it the it's not really the point these are inconsistent maybe they yeah. just i took the survey quite quickly to be honest with you i wasn't really thinking that i mean it wasn't the, the questions aren't hard it's it's you know it's obvious what the answers are um we should have taken some screenshots of the questions are these the actual questions yeah, or, yeah they, are, they're, they're, they are the questions. Yeah, they, I recognise them. Um, this is a reversal of the proportions. The last time Anglican priests were asked about the same issue, when 51% declared same-sex marriage to be wrong, compared with 39% who said they backed it. Linda Woodhead, again, conducted that survey and said, it's a very rapid change. These are very, these people, all of them say the words very and really all the time, I noticed. It's a very rapid change. These are very interesting findings. It's fascinating that you've now got this change in attitudes. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That's just a restatement of the thing. Um, a resolution agreed by Anglican churches worldwide states that homosexual practice is incompatible with scripture. The Times poll uh, found that 64.5% of priests backed an end to this teaching. Um, so with- there are, this was, a, it was a very strange one. So, so just say that again, 64.5% think that, that we should stop teaching that homosexual practice is incompatible with scripture. But presumably, given that there's 5% of people who would between that but, and who would offer blessings would would not offer blessings despite the fact that they don't think it's incompatible with scripture which to be honest is just rank homophobia um mm. <laughs> it's just, yeah, no, I, I mean you know it's weird anyway okay go um, yeah so anyway so there's more that's just basically a restatement the same kind of thing just, if, uh, should i just say that if, if you're if you're opposition to gay you know marriage and gay blessings and and the stuff is just based on 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 not on scripture but on how you feel i mean it, it it's just it's just homophobia in a way you know it's if, if you haven't got a the reason that i'm against all of this is not because i dislike homosexual people it's because i think that god has written what god has written you know? yeah i don't know tom i would um, be i'd be reluctant to just call people homophobic if they if they have a have another reason like for example you could you could object to it on on the grounds you know on secular cultural grounds you know you could say that marriage as an institution has existed for thousands out and thousands of years and that civilization has been based on it and to I think so, I think alter quite... it is to bring about is to bring about unknown changes which will almost inevitably lead to I, mean, I think that's a bit of a weak, a weak argument because in the end well, it's, it's, it, yeah, it might yeah, be a weak right. argument it's not a homophobic argument I guess it? not I guess not you're right but I mean you know there is there is a sense in which you know uh, I, I know um I don't think it is a weak argument by the way but even if it is a weak argument I, I well no, because because argument. marriage as a mar- marriage as a male female in is not actually historically necessarily what, what most cultures have done if you're just going to take a non-religious way of doing it you know bigamy and polygamy yeah, they're always cult- heterosexual um they're always heterosexual in nature yeah. I, I'd, be, I'd be i'm not i've not heard of any cultures that have adopted homosexual marriage um except for modern western maybe you're right maybe you're right but anyway i don't know, I don't know. So it's a weird thing like if you if you don't think scriptures against it there's this five percent of people what exactly is their argument but yeah, anyway I think, I think it's polygamy as well isn't it is a bigamy is like when you keep a wife's secret I oh think. that's right no, you're right polygamy you're right yes bigamy is Ill- illegal polygamy basically well right. yeah yeah oh it's it's like it's a first but, but i think bigamy is the crime isn't it anyway um yeah probably uh, anyway right. Um, yeah, so so we had all that stuff. Uh, the Reverend Andrew Forshaw Kane, who oh, 
the campaign for equal marriage in the church and married his partner in defiance of the rules said this is absolutely huge. Again, here is, here's all the reallys. I really think this survey is really important. It is it's really, really. It's, I really think this survey is really important. It is really clear evidence of the direction of the change the church needs to pursue. Uh, hope- uh, sorry, once again, point one, you know, refer to rule one. Anyway, go on. Uh, I hope this kind of evidence will enable the bishops to feel confidence there's a wide majority of change. The Bishop of Oxford, the Right Reverend Stephen Croft, who backed gay marriage uh, from uh, he was the first one to come out as a um, pro gay marriage bishop. He said, I think it's really interesting. I think it's very important that the question has been asked. I think it does show very much that the stance of the clergy across the country is more in favour of change than balance of views in the general synod. I hope that Synod will take notice of that as we move the proposals forward. Well, I mean, no, again, like the Synod's a a democratically elected body. I mean, there's no reason why it wouldn't be representative of the views of the Church of England, in a sense. I mean, yeah, as far as I'm aware, is is he claiming that Synod's somehow been gamed? You know, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird thing to say, but uh, yeah, he says many weird things. This, um, this comes back to what we we're talking about, doesn't it? About what? So, say this is representative. What conclusion do you draw from it? Do you do, draw the conclusion that the majority are correct and that the minority are wrong, and therefore the church wing should change its doctrine, or do you draw the conclusion that um, we are ordaining people who have heretical viewpoints? Well, I, th- I think it's not, interesting, we're not, isn't it? We're not, we're not teaching them properly. We're not teaching them proper doctrine and ethics. Um, and the other thing I would say, which I think is indisputable, regardless of what your view is, um, you must conclude that the Church of England is not doing a very good job at grounding its priests in its doctrine and practice yeah. if there is so much polar opposition as to what priests actually think. You know, people think priests think completely different things, which, so is, think, which is reflective of the poor leadership of the church. I sort of draw a number of things that have happened into sort of one, like, like for example, since since 2014, when this last over the last 20 years, things like um, kind of part time trainings got much bigger, much more common route into into priestly ministry. Um, we're taking our priests uh, quite a bit older in a in a sort of slightly desperate attempt to fill up numbers because they start to you know we're um, uh, we're, we're ordaining a lot more women priests and there has been a lot of research done showing that women priests are, well, I think, obviously, um, more liberal than male priests, um, not least because um, uh, the, the, there are relatively, the, 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 the most sort of conservative wings of the Church of England don't ordain women priests. Yeah, so, um, so conservative women won't, generally speaking, be yeah. likely to be ordained. Yeah. So, so you know, um, then, 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 yes, we got the rollout of um, the sort of centralised uh, s- framework for um, for training ministers, uh, and I think that actually it's not very biblically rooted. There's not very much. Um, there's a lot of sort of uh, practical theology. There's very little sort of abs- you know, uh, very little looking at um, the, the formularies. Or the um, or indeed scripture in detail. The requirement for languages is dropped, so people are much less biblically literate in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I just think um, we're not dropped, but much lessened. Like you don't actually have to do any real languages in in a common award uh, BA. Mm-hmm. Um, you just don't. There's not much there. Um, so, there's, so there, there, wouldn't you agree, Tom? Though that there's just a not a sort of ex- expectation when you're trained that you will conform to some sort of pre or some sort of given set of... Uh, well, we were introduced to the 39 articles for about an hour and they didn't yeah. really go through them, they didn't bother going through them. They just said, there they are, go and read them. You're going to be swearing that they're true. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, whereas I think previous generations of priests knew what the Church of England maintained and, it, you know, yeah. a, a I mean, biblical really literacy was... in yeah. college, in Ripon College, Cuddleston, which is supposed to be one of the, you know, one of the premier um, sort of... Uh, Voc- you know, premier training colleges for the Church of England, uh, biblical literacy was incredibly low. On the whole, yeah, it, which I, I think is probably the, the case in in all theological training colleges, I would imagine. Um, so, so I'm not surprised that we've got a load of heretics running churches. I know we've got a load of heretics running churches. You go to most churches, and the the quality of the preaching, the understanding of the liturgy, the uh, is it, very low. That's why you know. It's, it's why this is happening. 
and, and it just it's just self-fulfilling because then those people who have, who have been to churches where they haven't really been Anglican haven't followed the formula is haven't taught traditional Anglican doctrine or anything are then the people who are sent to theological college and aren't then trained in anything mm-hmm. yeah um, well yeah no I mean I think I think we're on we're on the same page there Tom uh, and I, I just just sort of to not not quite sure I, I got my point um exactly right what I, what I was trying to say is that um there's not a sort of expectation that there is a doctrine and a practice that the Church of England has and an expectation that clergy will receive that and then and then live it out faithfully it's a kind of well, you can be you can be of this tradition, or you can be of that tradition. You can be of this opinion or that that opinion. And um, well, a house it's like Christ says, isn't it? A house divided against itself cannot stand. And well, this, so- this is sort of John Dunnett says this, doesn't he? Who who heads the Church of England Evangelical Council? Um, yeah. Uh, who said, um, in my overarching response, he says, is it signposts a thoroughly divided Church of England? The question it raises, the million dollar question is, how is the church going to face a situation in which the level of division is both so substantial and runs so deep? Um, now, I'm not, I, I mean, I am a member of the CEC, the Church of England Evangelical Council, um, and I'm not actually in accordance with them about what they keep pushing. They're, they're, they're sort of slightly... Um, they want a sort of separate um, province that's sort of safeguarded. Um, I just don't think it's. I don't think it's going to happen. I think. I think um, you'd need some sort of. You need a parliament. You need to get it through parliament. You need to get it through synod. You need. You know. Uh, I think they're better off. Um, in fact, just coordinating a flat attack on the liberal church. Frankly, just just drive them out. <laughs> um, is what I want. I, I don't want to share my church with these people. Sorry. I don't want to go. Have to, I don't want to, to to have a church where more than sixty percent of the church, of the ministers uh, would sorry fifty percent fifty nine percent would offer blessings to same sex couples where, where more than sixty percent of them don't agree that um, the scripture condemns um, uh, sexual relationships outside of heterosexual marriages. You know, I just it's it's not. In yeah. the end, I just I just want them to go. I want them to get out of the church, found their own church. I mean, you can have the buildings, you can have the pensions, whatever. Just get out. Let us build a church along the lines of um, um, of the Bible. Mm. You know, uh, I guess the CWEC think that's a kind of strategic question, isn't it? Um, yeah. You'd be on the same page as them in terms of what you believe yeah yeah, yeah. it's how it's their response right yeah. the right thing to happen when well, you'd probably res- believe agree with most of what they believe jamie i mean there, there's yeah i'm sure i'm sure i would i'm sure i would um yeah so anyway let's do the end of the there's, a, there's a little sob story here between abby and bolthouse for generations everyone in her family has got married in the same norfolk church but she was unable to wear her fiance and we discover why shelly because she is a woman well, yeah. no, you it's can't. A well in. But... It's it's a well in use of language, isn't it? <laughs> she, she would she she would have been able to use the church to get married if she was marrying a somebody man. who could who she could be married to. But you yeah. can't be married to somebody of the same sex, just like you can't be married to like an object or like a an animal or something. And I'm not drawing equivalence, a moral equivalence between an object or an animal and a human being. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying it's a it's a category error. She has every right to be. She has the same rights as her ancestors. It's it's just that she doesn't want to exercise them. So it's just Orwellian. The use of language is Orwellian. Yeah. Um, well, here we go. This is this is when we get into actually quite. You know that well, all of that I mean, is, is all of a what sort of much of a muchness. But this is is someone. Uh, now we get into a slightly different yeah. sort of so tone, I mean, don't we? Let me let me just. Um, say a couple of things about this so that there's the heading is an end to the rejection of women which in itself is absolutely polemical and ridiculous as though to to imply that the catholic church's position on ordination is a rejection constitutes a rejection of women i object to that in the in the, in the strongest possible terms um and the times just showing how biased it is and how um malicious it feels towards anyone who holds to the catholic position which is the majority of christians in the world and the overwhelming majority of christians who have ever lived but let's just read some of this um the appointment of a woman as archbishop of canterbury would be backed by more than 80 percent of priests while two-thirds want an end to the system that allows parish parishes to reject female leaders uh, that even that is just inaccurate but let's let's take it let's take it like one one at a time shall we so the thing about the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, again, it's like it's hard to say how you should answer that question, right? Because 
um, you know, I hold the Catholic position on the priesthood and the episcopate, which is, I believe it's God's in God's intention. It's God's will. And it's just a reality that only baptized men can be priests or, or bishops. But then if they ask me, given the situation that I'm in, would I, um, would I support a move to make the next Archbishop of Canterbury a woman? There's a sense in which I wouldn't, and there's a sense in which I would. So the sense in which I wouldn't is that I don't think it's right, and I prefer it not to be the case. But if it happened, I would have to, in a sense, support it because I'm still part of the Church of England. So what do you answer to the question? Is is it's well? I mean, if you can't say yes or no, you can you can say oppose, can't you? I'd oppose it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recognise them as. I wouldn't recognise them as Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's this there's this thing called the five guiding principles, um, which are basically a page of waffle. Um, oh, Tom, I, I don't think it's fair. I think they are. Um, I don't think they they they're, they're interpreted as well. Maybe that's why they're called. Well, let's, Tom, we should we should but, tell the listeners because it's going to be confusing for them otherwise. Mm. So basically, for people who don't know, the Church of England started ordaining priests at the early nineties. Um, bishops, uh, sorry, priests as women, women as priests, uh, priests as women, uh, women as priests in the early 90s, um, women as bishops only about, what was it, like seven or eight years ago. And uh, we have a we have a situation in the church whereby if parishes want to, they can pass a resolution, which means that they will only receive the ministry of validly ordained priests and bishops, i.e. male priests and bishops, and people have been ordained by male bishops, right? So, and then the five guiding principles are principles that you have to agree to if you're going to be ordained in the Church of England, which basically recognise this arrangement as legitimate. And they say essentially on both sides, um, you know, if you if you are of the view that women should be ordained priests and bishop, that you respect the fact that there are people who don't don't um, don't hold that view, that it's not the view of the the Universal Catholic Church, and that those people should be allowed to flourish within the church. And similarly, if you're somebody like me who holds to the Catholic position, you recognise that this is a step that the Church of England has made and that we have women priests and bishops in the church and you have to work with them. Okay, I mean, I'd be interested to what you think it's waffled on, but I think it's, I think given the circumstances, it's not actually bad because it's it's quite clear and it gives it gives people of the Catholic position like me um, something to say to people like the right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So, but the reason I think it's bad is because it's effective. It's, I mean, for one thing, they now, I mean, they, they, um, so the, the five, the five one basically, um, holds that those who meet duly ordained and appointed office are true and lawful holders of the office they occupy and thus deserve due respect and canonical obedience. But how can you possibly give them canonical obedience if you don't believe that they are actually a bishop? It's, it's, it's it doesn't make any sense. Well, you can you can respect them as a bishop in a in a legal sense, I suppose. There's, there's no legal sense of a bishop. Well, there is, Tom. It's just just silly to deny. There's a there's you know there's clearly there are clearly. I mean, Tom, you're constantly banging on about canon law, as though it's a, as though it's a real thing. You can't just deny the the legal aspects of the Church of England completely, can you? I mean, the the main problem with the five guiding principles is they're a test act beyond the Bible, or in fact, a test act that actively rejects the Bible. You could argue. Um, so you're forced to sign up to them. You're not allowed now. You have to say that you're sent to them whenever you... Um... Yeah, but the way I see that, Tom, is it protects people of the Catholic position. It's, but it clearly it's, doesn't. People, people, the people on the other side don't need protection. You know, it, they... it clearly doesn't, because we now get into this situation where this... Uh, this I mean, um, Bishop of Dover... Yeah, yeah. So, um, so just before we read her comments, we should say that like this is something that the church agreed to at the time in order to have women bishops. Right. And the idea was that this was a matter which was um, this was a, a, an agreement that was put in place without a time limit so that people of both views could flourish within the church. So just I just want to say that before you read this part. Go on. Yeah. So, so the bishop of Dover said this. Uh, cannot the, the um, she welcomed the results of the survey because she's a heretic, and said the church cannot continue to speak with a forked tongue by backing women in the priesthood while also allowing parishes to reject them, warning that this would destroy the ministry of a woman. She called for a review of measures that allow churches to turn down female applicants for vacant priest positions, and reject the leadership of female bishops. Um, so this is um, uh, the essentially a, a, a broadside um, by this. Uh, Bishop of Dover um, against the five guiding principles. 
Um, so she and others have claimed, watch women in the church, women in the church constantly make this claim. That, um, it's one of the things that Martin Percy said. Uh, and, and when he when he torpedoed um, uh, Bishop of, um, now the Bishop of Burnley, no, uh, was the Bishop of Burnley, now Bishop of, where is he? Uh, Roger, um, North. Philip North. Yeah. Um, when, he, when he torpedoed his um, Sheffield um, offer, um, effectively. Uh, the 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 whole point of the five guiding principles is that they keep that space sacred, so to speak. Um, to use a to use a phrase, um, they keep that space protected so that people of differing um, theological um, principles can exist within the same church, and they would not have got the 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 legislation for women bishops through synod if they hadn't put this in place to safeguard that position. Now, I, I think it's waffle because mostly because I think it's been completely disregarded by bishops um, on the liberal side. I mean, I, you, you may hope it protects you, Jamie, uh, but I just I just don't see it being being upheld with any seriousness. Well, so- it does, no, Tom, sorry, I just I just completely disagree with this. Like, I don't have to have the ministry of women, bishops and priests in my church because of the five guiding principles. So yeah. I don't think you should just reject it in this way. I just think that's that's playing their game. They what they want to get rid of it. They want to, you know, disregard it so that they can go ahead with their agenda. Okay, I, I, I don't think it's going to protect you, is what I'm saying. But it does. Yeah. But, well, it, it, it does at the moment. moment. It's better than not having it. Yeah. I mean, what, um, what, so can I just make a comment about this, right? Yeah. So this this thing about rejecting women is um, is not what the Catholic position is. It's not about rejecting women. It's, no. it's about recognising that men and women have their proper places in the church and by extension in for, in the family and in society as well it's got nothing to do with rejecting women it's it's grounded upon the belief that god's plan for men and women is the best plan for human flourishing so they just they just put it in this completely negative way which i just completely reject and the other thing i would say about this rose hudson wilkins comment when she says that um this situation destroys the ministry of women my question would be why does it destroy the ministry of women that they can't go for every single job in the church isn't it enough that they can go for it must be if you include chaplaincies and things like that it must be 97 percent of the jobs in the church there is a small minority let's say in parishes it's something like five percent of parishes in the church of england which which cannot receive the episcopal and ordains a priestly um, ministry of the Church of England, 5%. It does not destroy the ministry of women to have those opportunities closed off to them. My being in a parish of that sort here doesn't, it is irrelevant to women who are priests and bishops in the Church of England. Why do they need to destroy the ministry of people like me in order to feel like they have a legitimate ministry? Because, you know, we talk about what what it would what it would mean for the church of england if this were to change this would be something that i'd have to leave the church of england over because i can't accept the ordained ministry of of women because i just believe it's wrong i don't believe it's even possible how would you how would you i mean i agree but if the, if the archbishop i mean in some senses unless you're actually in the canterbury diocese there's no allegiance owed to the archbishop of canterbury um in the church of england you know, it's it's he's just a bishop, one among you. You only it's it's sort of the the, the um my canonical my my legal right to be a, a minister here does not rely. I've never had to say any oaths to the Archbishop yeah, of Canterbury. Yeah, of course, you know. So unless you're in the, the Diocese of Canterbury, it makes no difference. The only thing about the Diocese of Canterbury is that it is the historic um sort of uh, primus uh, inter Ireland. You know, the the leader among primus leaders. Primus yeah. yeah, that's one leader leader of equals. First one, um, first one equals, yeah. First one equals of the of the Church of England bishops and indeed of the Anglican Communion bishops. Now, um, that latter problem is going because they're they're simply moving away from the Archbishop of Canterbury as having any sort of um because that was only ever a it's not really a legal thing. You can't have a canon you can't have a legal thing that like that that um why are you talking about this though, Tom Rose? I well, no, I'm just saying, saying if, if, she, if, if it was a woman. So one of the arguments against not, woman, I'm not I wasn't talking about the Archbishop of Canterbury. I was talking about the idea that getting rid of yeah. the getting rid of the uh, the right to um avail yourself only of validly ordained men um would would mean that people like me would have to leave the church. I, I think it's not it's not the same well, issue as the Archbishop of Canterbury being a woman. 
I think it would shatter for one finally the, the Anglican communion if if if, an, if the Archbishop of Canterbury was made a woman. Also, I mean, it seems to here suggest that uh, Reverend Sarah Mullally is a serious <laughs> as a serious um, contender for that post, which would be hilarious. Well, um, I think it's absolutely but, very likely that she'll become the next. I know it would be it would be the most awful thing in the world. I mean, I might even just have to. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, might, I have to leave the Church of England for the sake of it. Um, no. Um, yeah, but Tom, I'm talking about a different issue. I, I, I know, I know you. I, I mean, I don't sorry. want to just change the subject really I, quickly to this question of the Archbishop of Canterbury, which I think is essentially a kind of irrelevance. The, maybe what, um, what, what Rose Husband Wilkin is saying is that people like me and also even uh, and, and me, Jamie, I, Jamie I, I don't accept the, the, the Ministry of Women Bishops. Yeah, but you're but ultimately you would have to accept it if a, a woman bishop was ex, was ordained in your area. I would not. I would. I would, I would ultimately leave the area gave, until I found a, a, a diocese with a male bishop. I don't. Okay. Well, I okay, well you as well. The same. The same occurs to you as well. Uh, yeah, the same yeah. applies um, to you as as well. Yeah. So I just. I just want to just acknowledge what she's saying. There are there are five percent of parishes in the UK, or sorry, in the Church of England, I should say, that have taken yeah. a formal so, resolution. And there are other people like you who are, who don't like it. Just you know, on principle, and that so it's probably a, a much higher figure than five percent. And what what people like Rose has presumably about saying, thirteen. Rose, if this is right, thirteen point four percent. Yeah. So what she's saying is that people like that should be forced to accept the ministry of ordained women, which, as you say, was not what was agreed at the time. What was agreed at the time is that this would be uh, put in place without a time limit so that everyone could flourish in, in the church. And this is what progressive liberals always do. They always say, we just want this much. And then as soon as they get it, they want the next thing. And that's exactly yeah. what's happening here. Yeah. And it's disingenuous on the part of a bishop to do this because it's putting yeah. pressure. It's putting like a target on you and a target on your parish when you have bishops in the church being they're saying things like this so she shouldn't be saying it it's wrong so the other bishops should call her out on it and say that this is not what we agreed at the time and they should they won't. be saying this kind of thing in, in public of course they won't but um in any case uh because um because you you say something like that you get fated amongst like 40 percent of the bishops um the i mean it's probably what they half of them think um it's a problem it's the problem well i don't know i mean i don't know there was a there's a good comment somewhere isn't there um by somebody um a bishop isn't there it's not the bishop is it the bishop of ebsley oh no but he is actually sound on this matter oh yeah no the bishop of lichfield the right reverend dr michael ipgrave said the church was committed to quote the flourishing of all within the church including the great majority who support women priests and those who cannot do so quote without limit of time so he'd be an example of someone who presumably supports the ordination of women but who's also acknowledging that this agreement was put into place as he said without limit of time which is an important thing yeah. Yeah. So it's um, um it's, it's not necessarily it's, fair to and say. And it's that. also it also makes you quite um aware that um that any compromise and this is why I don't really like the CEC uh, and their sort of attempt to compromise in this, any compromise will eventually start being undermined as much as possible. Um, you know, and um and it would just start you know, start almost. It's only what seven years after this. It, this right was won for all time. You know, to to save to safeguard um, a position in the Church of England. And how how many years until the you know uh, until some sort of safeguarding uh, that's put in place for um, allowing those with a conservative understanding of marriage to to minister without in a similar sort of way. I don't know quite what it would look like, but definitely, this is the sort yeah. of um, this is definitely the sort of thing that. The liberal church, you know, it's probably the most likely thing is that you end up if the bishops go ahead, and you know, I still pray that they won't. With this, is that you end up with some sort of um, right to uh, be protected, um, have a protected theological space um, that will be protected forever, and then the next thing you know is that you know is the, there'll be some that you know, just nibbling away at that right, and it will yeah, be. Um, and th this is exactly how they do it. They do exactly the same thing. So I have absolutely no. Um, no time for this uh this it's um it's simply um i mean she said it before actually um and um and there are others who've said the same thing and they, and they sh if they want an all woman or, or, or a church like that much like all the other liberals they should just get out of the church of england thank you well and i want to make another point about this as well which i said earlier is that the the times did not give the option to stop ordaining women which they should have done yeah. um and it would have been interesting to see if people you know, if people were given the right to answer the question anyway, if how many people would have said that they think that the Church of England should stop ordaining women? Now, 
the the other point I was going to make about this is that I don't talk about this matter that much in public unless something like this comes up, precisely because of the of my understanding of the agreement that we have in the Church of England, which is that we're going to respect each other's ministries. Okay, so the way I sort of think about that is I don't go on about this. I'll talk to people in my parish about it. If people ask me about it, I'll give them my opinion. But I don't go on about it. I don't necessarily publicise my opinion. But the the equivalent on the other side to what Rose Hudson Wilkin has done is 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 people who are of the opposite opinion standing up in public and saying that women should not be ordained in the Church of England and that the Church of England should reverse its decision to ordain women. Now I don't do that, even though that might be my opinion. Well, that's one of the things I that's one of the things I don't like about the five guiding principles is that they imply that you're not allowed to have that position. No, I don't think they imply you're one, not one, to have it. Yeah, one, one, imply, of, one of them. They, they imply that you should. They imply that you have to recognise that the Church of England has taken this step, whilst not necessarily considering it legitimate in all aspects. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I okay, can't. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's a bit, a bit more than that. It sort of implies that you can't, you can't, you're not allowed to hold or campaign against this that it's made that the church of england has decisively made the step and that's it well i mean in in, in a sense it, uh, if if everyone was on the same page i wouldn't i wouldn't mind very much you know if, if everyone was allowed to if everyone if we were just gonna have a free fall or something like that it, um, it does it does affect you though i mean it does affect me for example i wouldn't um and i think as far as i can tell from the five guiding principles i'm entirely within my rights to do this i wouldn't consider someone who's been ordained by a female bishop to have valid orders so therefore their sacraments are not valid Therefore, I would not receive from them. Okay. Right. So, how am I supposed to know that? Well, you have to, have to just check everyone. Yeah. No, no. That's why. Um, mm. uh, so, we're getting a bit technical here, but but that's why the society is important. The society, for people who don't know, is the group of churches um, and bishops who um, safeguard the the, the Catholic um, line of ordination and valid sacraments in the Church of England. So if you're part of the Society of St. Wilfred and St. Hilda, you can know that you're, you'll be receiving sacraments from a validly ordained priest. But you're quite right, Tom. If you're, if you're not part of a group like that, then you can't know. Well, you can't know unless you check, unless you sort of carry around a, a, a copy of Crawford's. Copy of Crawford's. Does that even have the ordaining bishop in it? Does, does it? I, I think mean. it probably, I think it does, yeah. yeah I think it um, does. We'd need to. And um, so you sort of end up with enclaves, don't you? Right. And it's it's... I think I think that's one of the reasons why women bishops should never have been permitted because it does effectively come to, right to the heart of the validity of um, of the sacraments of not just women bishops but all those under them. But anyway, yeah, um, I think it, I think the other the other thing about it, and we don't necessarily want this to be all about women's ordination, but the other thing it does about it is it absolutely fractures the the universality of the Catholic Church, and it means that there's no possibility of of reunion with with, with the Roman Church or with the Orthodox Church. Uh, which which is something that was just discarded at the time as a as a point of irrelevance, um, mm-hmm. which is a tragedy in my opinion. Uh, even even if you really did believe in the ordination of women, that should still be a weighty point, that, um, which which should have received due consideration when the Church of England did this. But um, it just it just tossed that aside as irrelevant because we were told that this is the way to um, to appeal to society. Uh, so I think one last thing, Tom, is this thing about many priests are at breaking point. Apparently, almost a third of working age priests have seriously considered quitting in the past five years, while more than forty feel 40, more than forty percent feel overworked or overstretched. While some citing an abject lack, with some citing an abject lack of support from bishops, campaigners calling for more resources to be spent on traditional parishes. Um, so the results of the survey were not good news and showed a worrying trend showing how low morale is. Um, so, I mean, that's something we talked about quite a lot in the show, isn't it? And it's, it's sort of, um, they're, they're sort of referring to the Save the Parish movement there, aren't they? I mean, just the, just the obvious point to make about this is that if you put vicars in parishes and those vicars are half decent, the parishes are likely to grow. And if you don't put vicars in parishes, the parishes will shrink. And it's just sort of obvious that, the more the church under resources parishes with frontline clergy, the more the existing clergy are going to struggle and feel stressed and overworked. And, and I must say, overburdens clergy with with endless um, kind of uh, paperwork. Yeah. yeah, and and you know there really there really is endless paperwork. Um, it just never stops. Uh, various things, just things like um, you know the amount of work it is to to put a um, uh, to, to to 
make a make a usable space in the church you know, mm. faculties and stuff like that it's just it's really really enormous and it doesn't all come from the church some of that comes from statutory obligations and stuff it's probably a sign of the times but um uh it's just all in all um the administrative stuff you have to do and, and everything like that it's just it's a pain they could stop it a lot of it yeah so i mean yeah uh, that's so that's basically all I had to say about that. I mean, it's just it seems to me obvious that if they put more clergy in parishes, that the parishes would grow and flourish and, and more resources, more you know. Yeah. And it doesn't actually not just clergy, we could we could also have like some serious training for lay resources as well. Um, you know, youth workers, um, well trained things like that. Um, uh, it's it, the, but the but the, the burden on on just the parish kind of upkeep of the building things like that it's, it's, it is big and the more and the problem is that's the sort of baseline of burden it's the same if you have uh you know you add you, you, you doesn't if you've got three churches you've got three times as much work to keep them going than if you've got one yeah. so the more and, and the more churches you put in uh the more t- that sort of stacks up to the point where you get less time to do that which you should be doing and want to do and because you have to do all of the stuff for those churches so yeah 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 absolutely and I, was, I was quite shocked at this um uh, sort of an aside that uh, marcus walker who's mentioned in his article um and he wrote this article for the spectator didn't he uh is the church of england giving up on sunday worship oh, yeah. um and, and this church uh, this parish deanery of Kerrier is about to come one mega benefice made up of 23 churches and ministered to by wait for it two full-time stipendary priests one of whom and he's not making this up will not work on sundays <laughs> She will work primarily in the community, looking for exciting opportunities to grow churches for people who have either never been to church, who have had a breakaway. And actually, do you know what? A lot of those churches just running services on Sundays would would do the trick. Um, I mean, that just sums it up. I mean, that really does. Why that do you think that sums it up? Looking for exciting opportunities to uh, to grow the church, even though the church won't actually worship on Sunday. So. Ah, uh, Tom. Honestly, where where do you go with this? Where do you go with this? Really? Clergy person who yeah. doesn't work on Sundays. I mean, <laughs> what, well, what are they? What are they doing? Anyway, <laughs> I I tweeted Tom. I don't normally read out my tweets, but um, I hear uh, Nick Dixon doing it quite a lot. My tweets aren't as popular as his, but um, I posted this article on you know from the times and i said we do not win the culture by becoming like the culture we win it by being faithful to the truth unto the death people are longing to see a courageous authentic and faithful christian witness that gives hope to the lost why is this so hard to see and uh you know just to be say something positive at the end of this conversation which is pretty depressing is that um well you know firstly i'm really excited about my ministry i'm sure you're you're really excited about yours as well tom i find i don't i don't feel overworked um i don't feel burdened by it i think it's a joy and a privilege and i love ministering to people i love preaching the gospel i love seeing people showing up to church being interested people becoming christians people being drawn closer to christ i see i've seen it in my last parish i'm seeing the same thing happening here and um and it's not because of because I'm special or anything like that. It's just that I believe that when you approach these things with faith and diligence, that God blesses them. And it's a it's a wonderful thing to see. Um and just my frustration is the the cowardice, the weakness, the faithlessness, and the inability of the church more widely to just be what it's supposed to be. I think that's the thing that's so frustrating. It's so simple. It's so straightforward. You read the word, you proclaim the word. You're faithful to God, faithful to Christ, and God will bless what you're doing. And if you don't do those things, well, then you'll just decline and die. And all of this stuff about, you know, clergy well-being and everything like that, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not going to help the clergy if they have no faith and if they have no they have no belief, they have no they don't have the spirit of God dwelling in them, helping them to do this ministry. Um, because they're just they're just it's just death if that's what you're doing. That's just death. It's just living death, isn't it? Spiritual death, trying to minister the gospel. If you don't even believe it yourself, and if you've got no power to actually share it with anyone else. Mm-hmm. So just to try and say something positive, I mean, it's it's not positive overall, but there are lots of ministers in the Church of England, um, faithful ministers who are doing a great job and who are full of faith and seeing wonderful things happen. Um, so... I'm sure you feel similarly positive about your ministry, Tom. Yeah, 
No, I do. It's it's a great honour. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it's the most joyful thing you can ever do. And I'm just, yeah. just happy to be here. Good, good. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Put you on the spot there. <laughs> you could have said, ah, I hate it. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure living, you living next week. No. <laughs> um, brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, yeah. um, we've got a question, Rev, haven't we? Should we yeah, do yeah, the tune? Yeah, yeah, go yeah, on, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I always, I always have to load it up. Man, it takes yeah. absolutely ages. Uh, and also, I haven't even put the audio on. Ah, oh, no. On a Such an amateur. I know. Well, it, this is amateur. I mean, that's one of the things that makes it such a good show, isn't it? That we, we, although we are not professionals, nevertheless, where is it? Oh, I can't even find it now. Nevertheless, we we do it in a fantastic way. You know, what? I think I might have. Um, oh, look, there we are. Here we go. I mean, you call us amateurs, Tom, but do amateurs have theme tunes like this. Okay, Tom, it's time for another uh, edition of Question the Rev. Uh, this time, well, this is part of an email somebody sent me, um, and it was giving some feedback about something else, but I thought it might be kind of interesting to uh, to look at. It's a good so, question. Uh, yes, so in Uncollared, number 14. Now, to explain to people what Uncollared is, it's our special extra audio podcast uh, for people who become patrons of the show, which you can do for as little as £1.50 per month plus VAT in the UK by going to irreverentpod.com and clicking on the big red button and becoming a um, a supporter of the show. Uh, in Uncollared, number 14, Tom said, we are no longer in a position where God's revelation is carried by the nation state of Israel. I would like to ask what he meant by this. To me, the Bible, even the New Testament, is clear that everything in the Old Testament has a bearing on the new and on us going forward. Admittedly, the nation state of Israel is a heady mixture of belief in both testaments to various degrees. But I feel that believers in the new must always be respectful of the Jewish people who have carried God's word for so long, albeit they have not all yet received its full revelation. Many of them do have a serious faith in the same God that we do. And as I say, the whole of the Old Testament is so relevant and important to believers in the new. I have come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, not one bit of it will pass from from it until all is accomplished. That's Christ from the Sermon on the Mount. I know Jesus taught us not to depend on the law for salvation, but I hope that doesn't mean that we don't include it at all. There is also the fact that the nation state of Israel is not the same as the biblical nation of Israel. Just chuck that in at the end there. It's quite a um, complicated question. It is, it is a complicated So shall I have a go at sort of teasing some of it apart? So starting from the end, um, yeah, the nation, the modern nation state of Israel is not the biblical nation of Israel. That's fine. Um, when I said that um, nation state of Israel, I was talking about the biblical nation state of Israel, the the, the one that was existent from about, well, I think seventeen hundred BC through to about five hundred uh, to well, uh, with various invasions. Um, so um, that's the first thing um, I'd like to say. Uh, kind of um, h- how to tease the difference between Israel as a nation. Um, and Israel as a, as a collection of believers, because we're all all Christians are in Israel. We're all, uh, Paul uses that we're grafted into the root of salvation, um, and uh, sort of so the um, so there is a sense in which um, Israel is wider now um, than it was um, uh, because all Christians in Christ have been grafted in through Christ into Israel. Um, but the ceremonial, what I was talking about in particular uh, sort of um, uh, context of what I was saying was the um, uh, the law, the ceremonial laws of the nation of Israel, which are um, edifying potentially, but not binding anymore. Um, and that's the that's generally the um, the case with with the law. It's edifying, and so we should follow it, but it's no longer binding. But we should follow it because those who are in Christ should uh, should follow the law because it's an example that God's given of, of holy living. If you see, what I, uh, the, but the moral law, not the not the ceremonial law or the or the civil law, those are those are not necessarily part of um, the uh, of how we live our lives anymore. Jamie, do you want to say anything? You're saying the moral law is not binding, Tom. Sorry, no, no. Place, I was just wondering what you meant. By oh, what do you mean by binding? It is binding, but... Um, like the Ten uh, Commandments. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're binding, but they're not how we're... I don't mean binding in terms of what we should do, it's in terms of how we receive salvation. You know, we're, not, we're, not, we're no longer in a covenant. We follow them out of our... Because, because, we, um, because we have the spirit in us that leads us into righteousness. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I think about that, Tom, because I, I mean, it depends what you mean by the word binding, doesn't it? Um, I would still say that moral law is something that Christians should keep, you know, including the ten, including the ten. Yeah, yeah we, we keep, we should keep it. Yeah, but not because we have to, but because we want to. 
Um, no, I'd say we have to. Would you? Well, because we don't earn. We don't. We uh, well. Um, we don't I mean, earn again. any salvation through through following it. We we get we, salvation is through grace. But but having having received but grace, would you say we, the same thing about the commandments in the New Testament then that we don't have to keep them because you're justified by faith in Christ. As no, I mean, to go to go to go too far down that line, you end up in a sort of lawlessness, don't you? An antinomalism, which which we should guard against as well. I think I think the key is that that we. We follow the law and the church should teach the law as good and follow the commandments of God as given. We follow them not because we are saved by them, but because we are saved and therefore we follow them. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with that, but I still would say we have to keep them. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. We, we have because, to keep I mean, them. If, you, if, you're not, if you don't keep them, you incur God's judgment. And yeah, because judgment is... is, is um, so, so someone who is a sinner, which is all of us, could 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 would try to keep the law and fail to keep the law, but still be belief through belief in Christ be be redeemed. But we uh, should, yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah, but, so absolutely. But I, I just I don't think there's any difference between the moral law in terms of our obligation towards it between the moral law in the Old Testament and the no, I, I, that's not what I'm that, saying. The commandments that are given in the but New there, Testament, but there is a difference between the civil and the ceremonial laws in yeah, the Old Testament, that. which yeah. which 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 are, which are potentially edifying but not binding. So the moral law is separate. Moral law we follow because we should, um, not. But um, but the uh, but the but the civil and ceremonial laws we, we no longer um, follow. Yeah. Um, because they're fulfilled in Christ, and that's the whole point. He's, he fulfills it. He fulfills the civil and ceremonial laws of the state of Israel. He fulfills the ceremonial laws by being the one and only sacrifice required. That's what the Hebrew, the book of Hebrews tells us. You know, we no longer need to offer the sacrifice of the temple because the temple is Christ. And you know, um, and um, uh, and he fulfills the the civil laws in as much as those who believe him are incorporated into the into the body of of Christ and into the tree of salvation, the vine of salvation, which is Israel. Um, and the promise of God that transferred through Israel from Abraham through, through Isaac, you know, through the through the mm -hmm. patriarchs, that promise we inherit. Um, but we, so so um, so so it doesn't. It's not it's not abolished, but fulfilled in mm -hmm. Christ's in, in in Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're uh, saying. There is. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, I apologise if I took us off on a bit of a red herring there. It's probably uh, probably uh, better just to focus on that point that you're making. Um, I wondered whether um, the person who wrote in was trying to um, make a, a a point about how the Jewish people still they sort of still carry something of they they sort of still are the people of God even if they don't believe or something like that here, um, which is of course what. Um, there are lots of Christians who think that. I mean, one Christian we've we've re mentioned recently on the show, um, David Pawson, certainly was of that opinion that the that the nation of Israel still were in a sense the people of God, um, but they were the people of God in a different sense to the way that the church is. Now, that's not your position, Tom. It's not my position either. But that nevertheless is a position that lots of Christians have seen um, as legitimate um, at, at various points. Um, so I wonder whether I wonder whether the person writing in was um, saying that, and or sort of implying it in some way. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, well, I mean, I, I, I'm the, the, the old. The, the, I think I think Paul makes it quite clear in Romans that 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 whilst the Jews have a every advantage because they the law was given to them. Um, they they still need to acknowledge Christ in order to um, you know the 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 old dispensation is has stopped. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I I think I do. I don't. I'm not sure about the language of like the old dispensation and stuff like that because it's just it's just a it's just a word with a lot of baggage, isn't it? The word dispensation. Um, but um, but yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think the apostle Paul basically says. Um, that there will be some kind of revival amongst the Jews. Of, I mean, there will be an acknowledgement, sort of mass acknowledgement towards the end of history that um, amongst the Jewish people that, that Jesus is the Messiah and that mm -hmm. that will be a kind of um, a sort of um, a part of God's plan as we approach the end. Um, but for the, for the time being, it does seem like lots of Jews have been hardened to the reality that, that Jesus is, is really the Messiah. <laughs> And, Which and is... I, I think I think also just sorry just to finish that thought I think it is really clear in the thought of the Apostle Paul that 
the church is the new Israel. I mean, it just yeah. it seems to me to be very, very clear in what he says in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, well, not, I mean, Israel is what he says in, in Romans, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, grafted into the into that promise. Though, that's the, the key. Grafted, isn't it? grafted into the vine. Yeah. So yeah. As, as Gentiles, you know, we 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 must have humility because we're we're the ones who are grafted in, which is the point that Paul makes in in the book of Romans. Uh, that you know the tree well let's say the tree is christ the original branches are the jews and the nation of israel and then as gentiles we're grafted into it um but but um jews who reject christ as the messiah are no longer part of of god's israel in that sense because because that is now the community of people who believe in christ and accept him as the messiah and savior and so on yeah i'd agree so um but the, but then it's it's a it's a sort of it's a multivalent thing, isn't it? Because it, you can't just say, well, then there's nothing at all which is sort of special or unique about the Jews, because there there clearly is, because the oracles of God were revealed to them. Well, well, yeah. Well, this is, this is Romans two, isn't it? You know, so what advantage hath the Jew? Well, every advantage, because they've received more than just the natural yeah. sort of um, uh, the sort of general revelation of God. But you know, that, that, even if you if you have an advantage, that's great. If you don't take advantage of the advantage, if you don't you know for th- if you don't go through with it then then it doesn't really matter if you've got it it doesn't really matter if you have a 10 meter head start in a race if you just wander off to the side mm-hmm. you know i mean i, I guess yeah. yeah 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 no uh yeah i think that's right so it's it's an interesting question it's it's not a question i like completely sort of settled on within myself if I'm honest with you i don't i don't really i don't really sort of have a very sort of strong feeling about it um, because I do, I do think there is something special about the Jewish people. Um, even even the Jewish people who don't believe in Christ, I, I, you know, I, I think that there is something um, that the Jew that the Jews carry within themselves, uh, which I find yeah. sort of hard to I find hard to sort of articulate what that well, is. Still, yeah, I guess so. There's still, I mean, there is still a covenant there. I think, you know, um, and and I, you know, I, I'm not certain that the covenant has been retracted. But I mean, even you know, because God's faithful, so He'll yeah. always be faithful to Abraham. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm reading a book on the Sabbath at the moment by Abraham Joshua Herschel, who was a you know a, a, a religious Jew and ethnic and religious Jew, deeply religious man. And when you read a book like that, you think, well, you know, the man clearly had a great insight into spiritual matters and you know i'm i'm learning a lot about the sabbath you know from a kind of biblical perspective but at the same time there is also the very sort of but in the way that the book is written there is a kind of very very sort of strong implicit denial of christ as the messiah so i feel you know i sort of feel really quite torn about it that makes sense yeah yeah um, yeah, there's one point where he's talking about the teaching of the, uh, the teaching of rabbis on the Sabbath, and this, it's so similar to some of the things that Christ says in the Gospels, but he's just not mentioned as though he doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so it's it's an interesting question, isn't it? And uh, of course, people can write in reverendpod uh, at gmail.com and, and give us your opinions. These are these are or well, your viewpoints. These are matters on which um, people have um, strong feelings a lot of the time. Uh, which is why I sort of wanted to caveat it slightly by saying, you know, I don't, I don't want people to hear that I'm saying something really sort of absolute because in myself I'm still sort of wrestling with these questions. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I agree. It's it's not certain by any means, mm-hmm. and um, we, we might hope. I think we can we can certainly pray and hope for the for for, for all all peoples, but particularly for God's favoured people, the people who He chose, mm-hmm. um, the people who um, who bore His revelation down the ages. Mm-hmm. And, who he, who is, and who his love was faithful, um, even though they turned away again and again. But as don't we all? Don't yeah, we, we all? We, yeah, we all do. And the church does, doesn't it, Tom? We can hardly, um, <laughs> given what we've been talking about, we can hardly be too uh, haughty about these things. No, no, I agree. Anyway, Tom, we should probably leave it there. Yeah. Just do a quick plug to people. Uh, if you enjoyed, if you got this to the end of this somewhat grueling episode. Um, Please do consider supporting us. Um, I um, rely on the income that I make from online stuff mostly um, to live. Now, because I don't get paid money by the church, I just get a house. Uh, and we also have overheads and costs for the podcast as well. So we really, really appreciate people supporting this podcast as much as you can. And as I said earlier, you can do that for as little as one pound fifty per month plus VAT in the UK, which is not very much money at all. And uh, you get uh, our bonus audio podcast 
uncollared, which is us kind of often catching up, sometimes talking about stuff we wouldn't talk about uh, normally on the podcast. Um, just anything really that that comes up. It's just a little bonus for our for our um, supporters. So if you can support us, go to revenpod.com and click on the big red button to support us on Patreon, or you can just buy us a metaphorical coffee on Buy Me a Coffee, which is again it's on the website revenpod.com and it's the big yellow button. But we do really really uh, appreciate people's support. We couldn't make this podcast um, without without your support. We don't have any adverts or anything like that, um, so it really does make a difference. And if you listen to us and you want to support us and see this podcast go from strength to strength, then please do consider becoming a Patreon today at revenpod.com and click on the big red button um, yep. or buy us a coffee, which is a big yellow button. So anyway, so that's it uh, for now. And yep. uh, we should do a prayer. Um, should I do a prayer, Tom? Yeah, go on them. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for this um, time and we offer this conversation and to you and we pray for everyone who's listened to it uh, we do pray for your guidance and your help as we consider our place in the church and your calling to us at this time and we pray for the church of england lord for all the especially our leaders our priests and bishops that they may be turned to you in faithfulness that all of our hearts may be turned to you um, in faithfulness to your will and your commands and um, we pray for a change both in the attitudes of the people who are making decisions and bringing spiritual leadership. Um, and um, in the church as a whole, Lord, we pray for a change in the decline and the sense of hopelessness and um, doom that seems to sort of hover over this church. Lord, we pray for spiritual renewal and revival within the church, uh, in the parishes, uh, among the bishops, among the priests, and all who have positions of influence. Um, so we ask, Lord, for, for this. We pray for your blessing to be upon our listeners. Um, and uh, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay, Tom. Well, thank you, Jamie. The sign off. You. What's the sign off? Hang on. Uh, you say, um, stay, stay, um, is it stay, stay faithful? Stay watchful. Stay watchful. Stay watchful. I, I wrote it down, down in my diary last week. Have I, faith and watch. Uh, have uh, watchful faith. Keep keep awake keep, in, keep, keep awake watch. keep faith keep keep awake keep the faith oh that could be it. keep watch and keep the faith i think it was because oh. we, we decided against awake because it sounded a bit too much like woke keep woke yeah but it does um, rhyme keep awake keep the faith we're sort of half rhyme all right let's try it then shall we okay so yeah. until next time keep awake keep the faith